Yes, so, oh, test, yeah, it's working. So uh, yesterday, remember, I had like 380 slides. So I thought maybe today I ex can extend it. So now it's 498. Uh, I don't know, let's see how it goes, right? But of course it's a different thing and I'm going to kind of cover slightly different things and some of the things that I didn't cover yesterday. So thank you so much for coming. I hope it's going to be useful. I was enjoying a public transportation, Italian public transportation today. Uh, it was very interesting and I got a very good coffee, but I almost missed my, you know, my the talk here. So I'm really happy to be here. Now yesterday I kind of looked into the front end side and some parts of the back end side. And now I want to look a little bit more into design, but not too much, maybe like 10 minutes or so. And then the rest of the thing stuff is kind of some of the things that we haven't, we didn't cover yesterday. Now, when it comes to design specifically, I kind of want to us to look into the broader side of things. So what's happening in web design, like in general. And I'm talking specifically about visual design, but many things that I'm going to look into, or like that thing I'm going to look into is related to everything, the UX, the you know, the way we design navigation systems, the way we're designing tables and components and dashboards and everything. And it all boils down to personality, I think. Could we also dim lights, dim the lights, please, if possible? Um, and I'm spending a lot of time in companies and I'm spending a lot of time kind of trying to solve responsive problems or interface design problems. And very often I feel that many managers tend to have very strange and unrealistic understanding of what responsive design or creative process looks like. And most of the time, be it designers or developers, it's still fundamentally wrong because this is what I'm getting most of the time. The design process is weird and complicated because it involves people and systems and organizations which often are weird and complicated, right? Now that's a problem, that's the reason why we all kind of messed up with this uh, creative process because normally when I speak to managers, they tend to think that our creative process, whether we are designers or developers or diviners or desilopers, whatever you want to call it, because we're always in between somewhere, looks very predictable and iterative. You start somewhere and go, and you go and go and go and you iterate and iterate and iterate and iterate, and some of us are agile or pretend to be agile, and the others are waterfall, but one way or another, it seems to feel like many companies feel that this is the way what how creative process looks like. To me, it looks much more like this, right? Whether it's selecting a framework, whether it's selecting a library, whether it's selecting a plugin or a module or anything in between or an extension, it's always like a series of small iterations. We have to go and explore and eventually that idea that you might have had is actually pretty good and it's promising so you keep evolving this idea, but then you might hit the dead end and then you just don't know how to recover from this dead end. Right? And it takes time to reroute and find another solution that actually works better. So with this is why, because we don't want to lose time, we tend to rely on things that used to work in the past. Some of you might have seen this in the past, in a few months or so. Which one of these two possible websites are you currently designing today? Because you know, there are only two, there is one on the left and there is one on the right, and the only difference between them sometimes is that you have a carousel on the top or at the bottom, right? Everything else looks very similar. And maybe this is just because we tend to focus too much on those little details. We care about little details, they're so important, and every user really notices every single thing, right? And of course they are creating this experience, but aren't we over-engineering our designs at this point? Does it matter, like, I had this conversation thousands of times. Designers moving away from border radius 8 pixels to 11 pixels. Or 10, 10 pixels a month later. Does it matter? Maybe it does, but maybe we're also losing the big picture. Because if we just keep iterating, we might be hitting this local maximum where everything is just perfect and optimized. And you know, we talk a lot about A-B testing, like being that thing. I don't believe in A-B testing. I believe in A-Z testing. If I test, I test to very different things, not just let's change the shade of a button, right? And you know, the companies are really exploding in this degree, right? If you look into Facebook and you look into like all of those big players, I mean, they're ridiculous. If you look into all of this, there are thousands of iterations. Now we talked about 40 shades of blue for Google links. Well, nobody talks about 220 shades of icons on Facebook, right? But every single day they test a different shade of icon and then the engagement. It's, of course, it's all like A-B testing like two extremes, but maybe we're missing the big picture. 
right? And it goes on and on and on, and tweets are doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And we get too excited about trends. Like, how many of you might have seen this conversation? The iPhone X came out, and it has this little thing on the side. So this is horrible. Everything is going to die and explode, and oh, oh, oh my god, what are we going to do now? Now, if we look into the data, that doesn't matter that much, because the only problem when it actually is a problem, the, the only case when it's a problem, if you're using landscape on iPhone X. But actually, when people read articles or access websites, unless they're playing games, unless they're watching video, they're never in this landscape mode. Most of the time, it's portrait mode, like 98% of the time. So this is a problem that doesn't really exist. But we get so excited about these new things coming out and these new problems that can keep coming out, and we tend to, again, forget the big picture. And we like data. Now, here are some of the really interesting cool things I discovered just over the last two months. US smartphone users' number of apps, download, number of apps downloads per month. Right? Most people don't download new apps. All right, that kind of makes sense. On the other side, two out of 1,000 mobile users tap share buttons. We have this conversation about social media buttons and share buttons. Well, two out of 1,000 use them on average. Right? 90% of permission prompts, like, you know, hey, do you want to, uh, I want to know your location, these kind of things, are dismissed or ignored without even reading them. Right? So, you know, we tend to see things like that and we say, okay, so we should not use them. Right? But I think it's really important to actually keep a personality somehow embedded in your design as well, because otherwise it just becomes a very boring guidebook. This is how we design today or build today. Now, you should not define the line height in pixels. That's not cool. That's a best practice, right? You should not do, uh, well, it's a good practice not to use um, line height in pixels. In the same way, you should not base the breakpoints on device sizes, right? Everybody and people like me will tell you this, right? And of course, you should not take the name of the Lord performance in vain, right? Because performance matters, and of course it does. But maybe not always. Because what does it leave us with as a creatives? Now, one of the things that we tend to work, of course, when you have a new project, is start putting content inside and navigation, things like that. And you know, you have a bright canvas and you start playing around, but then somebody comes to you and tells you, no, 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 no. This is not how things work. You should start mobile first, not desktop first, mobile first. And when you start mobile first, it kind of forces you to really focus on what you're doing. And say, so, okay, so I'm going to focus on mobile first, put the navigation icon right up a corner, because this is where it belongs. This is what we do by default almost these days. And then somebody comes to you and tells you, no, 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 no. Right? Don't use a hamburger icon. Use a simple menu button. Menu button is way better because it's clear and it's obvious. And you say, OK, so I'm going to maybe just put the content in there. That's even better. It's more obvious. But then I have to organize all this content that I have. Otherwise, it just you know, becomes a very long, long page. And then somebody comes to you and tells you, no. No, don't put important stuff below the fold. And you have a wonderful method of keeping it above the fold, a fancy carousel. But then, of course, everybody hates carousels, right? So where does it leave us with? Well, here. That's creative process or development process, if you put it and apply it to development in 2017, right? And I tried very hard over the last one and a half years to find a framework, a mindset framework, that would move us away from this towards embedding some sort of personality to make your website unique uh, without spending too much effort on building it. Because you can, of course, if you go ahead and think like, about like, building an experience, you can invest a lot of time and effort into creating something unique, but not everybody can afford it. Right? And I asked myself one particular question. I mean, if you look at this site, this is data website, and it's uh, dedicated, it's like a homage to data art or data art, 100 years of data art. It's a remarkable website. Right? It's like if you, but if you look into it, can you imagine how much time, how much effort, how many people, how many resources, how much money had to be involved to make it happen? It was not a Sunday weekend project. Right? It was probably a bit more involved in that. So of course, if you, if you put a lot of effort, you can create some remarkable experiences like this. For a second, can you think about how you would build it in Joomla? Anybody? Right? That would be quite an effort. It's not an easy thing to do. Right? So this, obviously, I think we all agree, has a personality. Now, let me ask you something. 
Can you think right now of a website that was so memorable when you accessed it over the last two weeks that you still remember it today? Do you remember anything of the two, like of the websites, any websites, a website that you visited maybe over the last two weeks? Do you remember any of them? Except the one you're working on right now? Yes. Yeah, yes? Which one? Okay, so, <laughs> interesting, okay, but the point is, should websites be memorable, or are we designing invisible experiences? If we're designing invisible experiences, then maybe the border radius doesn't matter at all, after all, right? But if we do want to embed personality, we need to find a way of doing it. And I asked myself one very simple question, right? How come that I don't have any loyalty or any relationship to Uber at all? I mean, I've been using Uber for like two, three years now, but if there was a service that's like 10 cents cheaper on average, I will move right away. I will jump right away. There is no loyalty to Uber from my side. I'm like, okay, whatever. I don't really care. I'm just using a service. So this is like, it's invisible, I don't care. But it's really hard for me to move away from MailChimp. Somebody has to actively pay me money so I move away from MailChimp because I have such a strong relationship with the brand. And don't get me wrong, I'm not stupid. It's not about the mascot, and it's not about the monkey or a chimp or whatever. They have a very humane personality. They embed a lot of humanity in the design decisions and probably also in development decisions as well. So one of them is creating books like this that they just distribute on the streets for free to everybody to use, right? And they are not saying, hey, call, go ahead, here is a button, buy MailChimp, it's the most amazing email company in the world. Email is boring, nobody cares about email. Everybody wants to you know, get away, get, get rid of it, right, of this work. So instead, they produce humane products, which I think is really, really cool, and they give them away for free. This is what it looks like inside. It's just color books for children to you know, color, right? Just distributed to everybody for free. And the wording and the copy, fa um, copy, um, copy and the interface copy of it is just remarkable. Now, hi, I'm Freddy. It's fun to be me. Is it fun to be you? Now, there is no way you can answer this question in a negative way. Now, I'm just horrible. I'm so disgusting. I'm so boring. I'm the most boring person in the world. Nobody would say that, right? And it keeps going. It's just nice and funky and simple. And, you know, it's free. And even things like this, so I love being me. Do you love being you? How can you answer this in a negative way? I hate myself. Every single day. Sorry? Because I think it's really creepy using children. Yes, but this is not the point. The point is not about using children. It's distributing everything to everybody for free. They have this logo, of course, and the text MailChimp at the front cover, but that's it. They don't have any button anywhere saying, hey, buy MailChimp, and what it even, do what it even does, right? And so I asked myself, so how can we make this happen? Why does it happen? Why do I have such a strong relationship? Because with MailChimp. And why do, what do I want? What should I want to do? Should I create products that are memorable? Should I create products that are invisible? And I kind of want to create a few things that are memorable. So I asked myself, so what would be a nice framework for it? So let me share you a couple of stories. One of them is Tijuana Flats, which is a chain of Mexican restaurants in the US. And that's what they look like inside. Now you might hate it, you might like it, that's not important. Uh, you can see the personality shining through on the walls, right? And these walls are pretty huge. I mean, these are the people there, right? And these are the walls. So they're pretty you know, tall ceilings and stuff. And so every four or five months, they would hire professional graffiti artists to come in and you know, paint the walls to kind of unfold the story. And of course, the restaurant menu in that chain, in those restaurants, has to reflect this personality somehow. So this is the menu, and you know, it fits in with the story. And of course, the website should fit in the story as well. So this is the website. Can you think for a second how you would build it in Joomla? Would it be difficult? No. Okay, but every single thing here is like it fits with the story. Now, in the spirit of best practices of 2017, in the spirit of us all hating carousels, of us all hating, you know, aiming for performance and hating web fonts and all the, those things that we should not do, right, they said let's strip it away and keep it clean and simple, right, flat and, you know, everything. Moving away from this to this. And I think there is a lot left 
on the side between this design and this design. I would love this website to look much more like this and much less like this, right? And no company knows it better than Blomberg of all companies because they decided to really go into the gray area. They wanted to reinvent themselves and they had a problem, a fundamental problem. They didn't have any loyalty. They were like Uber of financial companies in a way, of financial broadcasters. So I thought, okay, so how can we make it work? Let's try to make it a bit more interesting. So they hired a bunch of designers who were given the freedom to do whatever they wanted. And oh yes, they did whatever they wanted, right? So you might hate this, right, this design. How many of you hate it? How many of you like it? How many of you want to leave now? <laughs> okay. Um, you might hate it, but it served its purpose because they sold out within three or four weeks, which was much faster than previous years. So it might be a bad design, but it's a great design because it served its purpose, right? And they keep going and iterating and risking these crazy, just strange and crazy features every now and again. This is 50 companies to watch in 2017, and it's just strange. I mean, I wouldn't go this way, and I wouldn't want to do that, because this is kind of on the, on the way against accessibility, right? More towards being different for the sake of being different. But it kind of shows us that everybody's trying to do something just to be different. And one of the things that you will never forget is the Elon Musk feature, because this is, has came out just last, uh, last month, and that's, that has to be in the museum somewhere, right? So this is the feature highlighting all the projects run by Tesla and Elon Musk, and it pretty much breaks every single rule that we know of, right? Every single rule that we're used to, right? And it goes that way really overboard, but again, at the same time, it's one of those, you know, the heaviest features that we actually got the most traffic on Bloomberg, right? And this is happening quite significantly, like quite a lot, because if you, even if you look at things like Dropbox, how many of you have seen the Dropbox rebranding? It's kind of all over the place. Again, you might hate it, you might like it, but it's like really a bit over the board just for the sake of being overboard, right? So not everybody can and not everybody will want to pull this off, right? But maybe we can do it in a slightly better way, in a slightly more gentle way, in a way. So how can we do that? Now, oh, one more story, sorry, I have to tell. Um, and even if you don't have a great product to sell, you can still wrap a fantastic story around it as well. So this is a story of Hans Brinker Hotel. Now, here's a problem. Hans Brinker is a hotel in Amsterdam. How many of you are from Netherlands? Okay, so how many, many of you will know it, I think. Hans Brinker is a hotel in Netherlands, and there is a problem. I mean, if you're running a hotel, you might run into a little problem. Now, that's not a good hotel, okay? If you're not a good hotel, you will have issues selling rooms. Right? It's not like you're getting five-star reviews on TripAdvisor or anywhere. Right? You are lucky if you're getting two or three stars. Most of the time, it's going to be one. So what do you do? You have a couple of options. You just close down and go home and drink and do something else with your life. Right? This was not an option for them because they had mortgage going on and things like that. At the same time, you can try to make it better or look better. Well, it was not really an option for them. And so they hired a designer who said, well, who was paid one burrito, as far as I understood, from, for the job. And basically he said, okay, so we can't pretend to be the best hotel in the world. We are not that great, right? So what if instead of being a good hotel, we sell the idea of being the worst hotel in the world? Maybe people want to have the worst hotel experience in the world. And guess what? They're expanding to Lisbon now, right? Because they're sold out, I mean, not all the time, but they're sold out two weeks in advance most of the time, especially in hot season, right? And the website, of course, reflects it, right? It's, it cannot be good at all. This should not be good at all. And so they hired a photographer who wasn't professional enough because otherwise the photos will look too professional, right? So if we go ahead and scroll down here, many things here are just weird. <laughs> a little bit strange, I would say. But this is, again, the story they're telling. And again, if, even if you have a horrible, horrible design, you can actually still pull that off. And you know we talk about things that we shouldn't do, like for example, you know, social media buttons, do not pull social media buttons in. They're going to be horrible for performance. And I would say just wrap a story around it. You know, if you have a horrible hotel, 
don't have just one Facebook button, maybe you can have a couple scattered all over the place. So if you scroll down further down, maybe it could look like this. Just have 20. Not one, well, either one on zero or 20, not two. That might be more interesting, right? But of course not everybody can pull it off. But somebody, well, each of us can do something else. Right? We cannot create something inaccessible like this. This is really just weird and confusing. And I hope you appreciate the hover cursor effect as well. Right? That's just something different. Right? But what if we apply the same idea in a slightly more humble way? Right? This is, uh, uh, I think it's, uh, it's an exhibition website. And you can just move things around. That's the signature. That's the thing that makes this experience different. If you remove it, it will look exactly like everything else, every other exhibition website. Or pick one annoying element that everybody hates and make it a bit more interesting, right? I mean, many of you will hate pop-ups. Now, welcome to the most delightfully annoying pop-up in the world. I would love every single website to have it. It's so annoying, it's remarkable, right? I really think it's really, it's really well done, right? I would love it to be everywhere. And again, it fits in with this story too, right? Or something else, maybe here's another boring one. You know, if you're visiting, let's say, a whiskey website, alcohol-related website, tobacco, things like that, you have to type in the name of the day, or the, your birthday, right? And sometimes you can even type in the 32nd or 43rd of 1547, uh, and you can still enter the site. Because they don't care, because most people lie anyway. So maybe turn it into something a bit more interesting, right? So are you 21? Hmm, no. Hmm, too bad. Well, are you at least 18? Hmm, no. Hmm, 17? <laughs> you are not making this easy. Please tell us you are 16. <laughs> Jesus Christ. 13? <laughs> hmm, no way you're going to click yes now. What the shit? You have no, if you're not at least six, we're going to have serious problems. <laughs> Say no again. Right? And there is no way to click yes here, by the way. <laughs> Which is kind of cool. And then you click on no, and voila, of course, they're getting like tons of videos like this everywhere. Right? So this is like one thing. Once you see it, you have an emotional connection right away. Right? This one thing is enough sometimes. Here's another one. You know the title thing that most companies do just because they want to spam people? Right? Super annoying. Nobody really needs it. But you know, if you do need it, just make it a bit more interesting. Not just Mr. Mrs. and so on. Go overboard. Maybe you like to be a captain today. <laughs> or maybe a little commander. I don't know. What do you feel like today? And it actually goes all the way. And it's a long thing, right? So maybe you feel like Earl or Professor or Earl Admiral. I don't know. Right? You can do that too. Another thing that's also quite fun, sometimes you can play with music, but not too much. So here's an interesting example for it. One band camp, when you log in, they play the elevator music, <laughs> right? So you fill in the form, and it has this, like, it's like you going up the elevator and things, and then the password, or yes, the password. And then you click on log in, and it's being verified. And once you're finished, you're just coming back because you arrived, right? It's like one thing that also actually could be quite interesting to use as well. Or even things like this, right? Because why not? <laughs> that one thing, this is one simple thing that you can actually put on your website and nothing else, right? So what of it can you use today, right? Think about like what is one simple thing that you could use. Now it could be the visual treatment. This is like where the illustration comes in. Like uh, Kara's slides yesterday were there, it's just amazing. Because this is like a very unique style. Everybody has, like every illustrator has a very unique style. So hire an illustrator. Right? That could work. Another thing, if you can't or don't want to, well, just think of an idea. Just split yourself into three parts. This is his signature. And every time you resize, every time you hit the page, it's going to be displayed randomly with a random background color. That's his thing. It's not horrible. That's his signature. Right? Or think about transitions and animations. Right? One simple thing, if you remove all the transitions and animation from here, it will look exactly like every other portfolio website. Right? But this silky smooth animation in the right, it's what makes it different, right? Um, even sometimes the lack of transition or the lack of animation, we talk a lot about not slowing users down, kind of don't make people think, 
but maybe we should make people think, or just for a second slow them down. So as you scroll, or as you move across the site, things kind of appear slowly with some geometric placeholders that kind of pop in as you scroll down the page, right? So I think that's pretty interesting. Or just one simple visual treatment, like this slanted thing that's consistently used everywhere on the site. That alone makes it a bit different, right? And Sometimes it's also about user interaction. Now, I was very impressed when I actually accessed SPB Mobile, which is like the Swiss um, trail, rain, rail train system. And so you download the app, and let me just scroll it, make it a bit faster here. And if you want to book a ticket from one place to another, normally you have to type in where you are or just use location. Instead, just use styles, right? So here you can pre-select whatever your favorite destinations are, you need to buy a ticket, swipe, connect the dots, and you're done, right? That's just rethinking interaction. One simple thing that makes this experience very unique, right? And one thing that we always do when we start working on a new project is ask ourselves, now what if you had to redesign or rebuild whatever you are doing today, but you could not or were not allowed to use any circles or rectangles? What would you come up with? If you cannot use any rectangles or circles, you'll come up with all kinds of different shapes. You'll come up with all kinds of different ideas and concepts, right? And you can just go ahead then and say, maybe I can plug in the circles and plug in rectangles to make it a bit more interesting after all, or more predictable after all, right? But this is one thing that actually really is interesting. And even if it means creating something crazy and weird like this. I mean, I don't know why it exists, but I don't mind it existing, to be honest, right? So that's quite interesting. And I'm really looking forward to explore what we can do now. For us, in our case, that thing that was different was the logo and how we actually brand it. Because we decided to actually take this idea and figure out, okay, how we, would we do it? And we started, very simple, by looking into the text first. Now, I talked about it yesterday a little bit. We started looking into components and things like that. But very often, once I wrote down the components in plain text, my key, uh, my gateway towards you know, the initial design was not like let's do the mock-up or let's pick a template or let's choose a framework. It was let's figure out what the voice and tone is going to be, what the text is going to be. So my starting point was not you know, components per se, it was error messages. And this looks a bit weird out of context, right? But I spent a lot of time working and refining and crafting those error messages. Because why? Well, if you are a user and you come to the page and you encounter a problem, right? If I can make you smile at this point, at the most annoy annoying and frustrating moment, I can maybe establish this connection, this emotional connection that I wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So once we looked into the error messages, we also looked about the visual experience of what we maybe want to provide in terms of interface copy, thought maybe we could actually transform it into a typeface that would support it. So we started looking into typefaces, and we picked this typeface for body copy, and we pick this one for headings. And I don't, I'm not a big fan of it, just look at the A. Right? I'm not a big fan of it, but it kind of fits it in within our personality, because when we started working on the site, it was quite remarkable to see many people seeing us very differently than how we saw ourselves. Right? Normally I wanted to be, you know, set up a professional publication for experienced designers and developers. Right? When we started looking into user interviews and research, it turned out that most people associate us with something very different. They would say things like open-minded and friendly, things like that, and they would talk about cats. And we have a couple of conferences every year, and every conference has to be promoted, so we have these cats. And people were talking about cats all the time. Now, I did not want my legacy to be cats, right? This is not why, why we exist in the first place, but this is how people connected, connected us. And we thought, okay, maybe our signature, the thing I was talking about in the beginning, could be the cats. Like, we don't really need a mascot, but we could actually use what we have already. So I thought, okay, not just one cat, that would be a bit sad. Let's have a family of cats. Oh, you know what? Let's have a lot of cats. So at this point, in the new design, we have 68 cats scattered all over the interface. If you find all of them, if you do find all of them, I guarantee you to book a flight, a business ticket flight, to any destination of your choice with a hotel and you know, accommodation, whatever, you will not find them, right? They are all over the place, but there are 68 of them. And they're kind of friendly, more, most of the time. 
right? But another thing that was also important is not just have this. You can't just have one mascot. This is not going to be enough. And not everybody needs a mascot. Almost finished. It's also about finding the right angle. In our case, it was literally about finding that angle because when we started playing with the layout, it felt like, okay, it's a bit art directed and magazine alike. That's fine. But then at the same time, it doesn't have that personality that we developed. It doesn't have that funky, informal personality that we wanted. And we started looking into the, uh, what could be our signature then, and we looked into the logo, and the logo is tilted, well, the S is tilted by 10.6 degrees. Now, we did a redesign first, and we moved away from 10.6 to 11. It was a very big step for us, very big step for us. And then we thought maybe this could be the thing. So maybe everything could be tilted, right? So we started playing with this idea, and this 11 degrees, or 11, um, well, also border radius, 11 pixels, has become that thing that we actually were using then consistently. So every single thing is tilted by 11 degrees. All right, and even interaction design are the same thing. And so we moved away from this, and this is how it all came to be. So in our case, the interface copy plus that signature that you can see like through the cats, of course, and through the tilting is what has become our signature. And it goes for everything. This is the form. And of course, it's tilted because it has to be. Right? And also, every other thing on the side is tilted as well. But of course, when you tap on it or hover over it, it's like a regular thing. And even things like this checkbox, right? because I know that many of you are dog people here. Right? Many of these things were decided way before we had a visual design at all. And that goes for you know, animation and things like that, too. And so this is kind of what we learned. This is kind of my framework. Just pick one thing that's either annoying or just becoming your signature and then use it consistently. For me, that was a really, really big help. Right. So and this is how it all came to be. And everything is, of course, tilted, right, because it has to be. Now, we can go into other things, but I think I, do, want to, I do, want, do not want to roll around. So it was like just a little bit of insights into the creative process. But I think it's really important not to think about this. Oh, it's like it's not important. Um, it's not to think about it as a design thing, like this is what designers do, like you know, design stuff. You can apply it to development as well. Think about how you would apply some kind of personality in, as you're building. Because eventually, you might need, if you build a component and you want to have a consistency, you need to stick to this consistency somehow. It can be reflected in a design system, in a pattern library, in a style guide. But then you need some kind of guidance. right? So maybe you could work together with designer to make it happen. So this in mind is actually pretty much well, all I wanted to share within this last 30 minutes. And thank you so much for coming. And I hope that you're going to have a good day. And one more thing. I know, I know that there are some Joomla in action, there's some Joomla in action happening uh, next. And I, I mean, I just met some of you. And I met the organizers just a few days ago. right? And again, as I said yesterday, it's really kind of a cool thing that you're having here and what you're doing here. Like the open source movement and the community you have, it's very, very cool. So if you have some time to spare, please go in those Joomla in action things rooms because I think you can actually make a difference because so many people are using Joomla these days as well. So this in mind, thank you.